Hello, Light Church, and welcome. We are so excited to have you tuning in online this week. If you're new with us, we want to give you a special welcome and say hello. We're so glad to have you. Um, if you would like to be connected and know what's going on here with us at Light Church, we encourage you to check out our website at lightsandiego.com. Um, there you can get connected, learn more information about what's going on, and stay up to date with us. At this time, we're going to get ready for a time of worship. Um, I just encourage you to ready your hearts no matter where you're at. Know that um, the Holy Spirit is there with you. Um, um, and it's, this is a great time um, to just give him the glory and honor that he so deserves.
One of the reasons I love the letter to the Colossians is because it asks the question, is Jesus enough? And it asks it in a context that's 2,000 years old and literally a world away. But it's the question that we've all been asking this past year, and if we're honest, our whole life. Is Jesus enough? Is He who He claimed to be? in a world that is uh, increasingly trying to communicate um, counter narratives and trying to captivate and compel us with this philosophy and that. Um, I find myself uh, as a pastor and just as a human being constantly finding myself going back to that question, is Jesus enough? And so Paul again and again addresses this question and answers with a resounding yes. Jesus is enough. And it's at that point in the letter when he's talking about the significance of Christ's death and resurrection, the victory that that promised, that Paul in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 16, picks up on that concept and he says, therefore, essentially saying, because of the greatness of Jesus, don't let anyone judge you in regarding to food and drink or in matter of festivals or new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what's to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in aesthetic practices and the worship of angels claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions and their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons grow, um, grow with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to its regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines, although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body. They are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. And so this part of the letter, Paul begins to use this analogy of a shadow and a substance. And he's addressing really one of the prominent threats facing the church, which is this idea that if you were to follow Jesus, you had to adopt uh, the traditions of the Jewish religion. Essentially, that if you were to follow Jesus, you had to first convert to Judaism. But this wasn't just a maybe kind of a traditional understanding of Judaism. This was kind of this mystical Gnostic Judaism that Paul is addressing. And so he's addressing some of the things that marked this, uh, this sect or this belief. Things like festivals and the way of thinking of, of new moon uh, holidays and celebrations. And, and they, there was this belief that as they entered into that, that they would somehow enter this angelic realm and they could interact with the spirits. And, and in the midst of that, uh, Paul just really just speaks some tremendous truth that these traditions that they were trying to force upon uh, these non-Jewish followers of Jesus were something that he describes as a shadow. The Greek word for shadow here is skia. And skia is used to describe an outline or a shadow of something that it casts. Um, and by looking at the shadow, all shadows point to an object of substance 
And although a shadow has no substance in and of itself, it's pointing to, it's actually leading towards something that carries substance. And this is why I think the key verse in this passage is verse 17. It says that these, and talking, talking about these, uh, these ancient religious traditions, kind of these Jewish holidays and Sabbaths, it says these are, these are a shadow of what was to come. The substance of that shadow, what that shadow is leading towards and pointing towards is the substance is Christ. So I want to just talk about this idea. If, if, if Jesus is the substance, Jesus is substantial, he's enough. And there's three things from this passage that we should pick up on. Number one is that when Christ is our substance, shadows begin to be revealed. Number two, self-indulgence is reoriented. And thirdly, it solidifies our belonging to Jesus. Let me just walk through these three things. And the first one is that when Christ is our substance, shadows are revealed. This is going to take us to do a little bit of, um, of homework. If you are new to Christianity, maybe you're new to Light Church, um, a lot of this language might sound foreign. So let me, let me try and kind of set this up. Jesus um, was a Jew. Um, yes, he was fully man, but he's also fully God, but grew up in the ancient Palestinian Near Eastern Jewish tradition. And with that, it was out of that movement that based on, based on a covenant and prophecy made hundreds and hundreds of years before, out of that would become a blessing to all nations, all people groups. But because its roots and its origin were within Judaism, a lot of questions come up. Well, what do we do with these Jewish roots? What do we do with how in our Bible says the Old Testament, which is also known as the Hebrew Bible? What do we do with all of these laws? What do we do with the Mosaic uh, Code and the Torah and these 613 rules that we find in there? What's our relationship to them? And this is a constant topic that the New Testament continues to reiterate because it's an important one. How much of this transcends? How much of this do we carry over into followers of Jesus? And it's a really important question to ask. And Paul's definition here, in short, is the holidays, the Sabbath, these rituals are a shadow. Now, if we understand this as a shadow, there's, there's two things that could be misconstrued. Number one is what was happening in this church. The shadow was starting to take substance. And the people were saying the shadow is the most important thing. And these are the things that really matter. matter. And I think in our day and age, we almost have the opposite problem. We haven't elevated the shadow, we've almost completely disregarded it. We choose not to read the Old Testament because we don't know what to do with it. We, we choose to think of, when we hear the word law, we immediately have this negative connotation to it. And so I think the most important thing for us to, to understand is what do we do with the, the heritage and the origin of this, this shadow, of these Jewish traditions and feasts and, and things like that. And how does that correlate with Jesus? And so Hebrews uses this same word skia and he describes like this. These serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. To that degree, he's the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. And again, in Hebrews 10, it says, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Uh, one of my professors, Gary Brashears, describes, describes uh, the law, the Torah, the Mosaic uh, code or covenant as an interim ethic. It was given to the people of God to shape and form them as a consecrated holy people. But these laws, these things were always pointing towards a future deliverer, a future and new and better covenant. And so when we look back, our goal isn't to look back and define the substance because that's in Christ. 
But at the same time, when we look backwards, we get to see the beauty of the shadow. The shadow is pointing towards Christ. And so I just wanted to, um, again, just to, to reiterate this, is to ask the question, well, what did Jesus think about his Jewishness? What did Jesus think about the Hebrew Bible? In Matthew chapter 5, he said this, Don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. The the key word here to understand Jesus' relationship to the law is this word fulfill. He didn't come to abolish it, which I think, sadly, I think a lot... Um, of followers of Jesus have kind of done unintentionally. They've kind of just swept it away. But he said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. That word fulfill is a Greek word telos. And it means that the end goal, the, um, if you think of a telescope, uh, it's when you're looking forward to what it's pointing towards. And Jesus says, I'm the telos of the law. I came not to, to do away with it, but I came as the fulfillment. I'm the end goal of that law. It's perfected in me. This is why in Luke 16 it says, Until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the message of the prophets were your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. But that doesn't mean that the law has lost its force. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear and the smallest point of God's law to be overturned. Um, recently, I was watching uh, Peter Pan with my kids. I think it's the first time Augustine, my son, got to watch it. And there's this scene in the, in the early animated film where Peter Pan goes to Wendy's room looking for his shadow. And he, and this kind of this, this comical moment where he finally gets his shadow and he immediately tries to, to have a relationship with his shadow by using a bar of soap to stick it to himself. And Wendy kind of laughs at him and says, no, no, that's not how you do it. And then she goes and, and sews it. But as I was studying this, I just had that picture of of so many of us uh, not knowing what to do with the shadow. And so we have this awkward relationship with these things. And so I'd say for the majority of our culture, we have the opposite problem than the Colossians had. The Colossians were elevating the shadow where we have dismissed the shadow. And again, the shadow's purpose is to lead us towards the substance the same way there's the shadows that are behind me. If you follow those shadows, they'll lead to the tree. They'll lead to the hill. They point to something that is casting that shadow because of the light being illuminated by it. And so you might be asking, well, how does Jesus do that? Well, I don't know if you know this, but every single major event that happened around the death and resurrection of Jesus happened on a Jewish holiday. Did you know that? For instance, Jesus was crucified on Passover, Jesus was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. He's the first fruits from among the dead. His resurrection marks our first fruits. And the Holy Spirit came during the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, the giving of the law. And the law was the terms of the covenant. The Holy Spirit comes as a sign of the new covenant. And guys, there's, and I wish I had time to get into it. All this to say, there is a richness when we can see the shadows and we can look back and see how they point to Jesus. But there's a danger when those shadows try and become the substance. And so the question might be because, again, we're not dealing with maybe elevating um, ancient religious thought to the point of Christ. The question that we need to ask contextually is, what are our shadows? What are the shadows in our lives that we have elevated to substance? What are the, the good things What are the human made things? What are the philosophies? What are the traditions that we have raised up and we have put them at the same level as Jesus Christ? How do we know when a shadow becomes and starts to become a substance? So I just wrote down five things that that we should evaluate when something becomes too great in our hearts, too great in our souls. It's when a shadow forms our identity. And again, a shadow could be any form of human tradition, human philosophy. It could be a political ideology. It could be a job. It could be education. It could be a relationship. It could be these things. And for the Colossians, it was speaking specifically, again, to this this Jewish heritage worldview. But that doesn't mean there aren't other shadows. 
that we put too much substance in. And so just five questions to ask is, when a shadow forms our identity, when a shadow becomes our source of peace and salvation, when a shadow demands our ultimate focus and attention, when a shadow's ideal becomes an idol, when a shadow clouds our vision of others, um, it doesn't take me more than a few seconds to think back over the past year and to see so many things that are not necessarily bad, but they've been elevated to the point of, of rescue, or they've been elevated to the point of redeem, or they've been elevated to the point of salvation. And I think the whole time, which is why I'm loving this book so much, is Jesus says, that's, that's my seat. Uh, there's, there's no um, financial security that you can have that's better than my security. There's no political leader that you can have that's better than my leadership. Uh, there's no sort of relationship that's more enriching than the relationship that he can have with us. All of these things as human beings, we chase the shadows and Christ is the substance. The second thing we see in this passage is that when Christ is our substance, self-indulgence is reoriented. You might be like, what do I mean by that? Well, listen to the last verse of this passage. It says, although these, talking about these different philosophies and traditions have a reputation of wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, severe treatment of the body. It's one of the, one of the um, thoughts was that fasting, um, by severe fasting, literally starving yourself, you would then be put into a trance to enter into this angelic realm. And so Paul says, it has this appeal. It looks like wisdom. It says, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. And I love that. It's just kind of this final blow Paul gives. He says, listen, no matter how hard you try to follow these laws, no matter how hard you try to do this strange Gnostic Jewish mysticism, it's never actually going to change you. It's never actually going to curb your self-indulgence, this selfishness. But Christ can. When Christ becomes our substance, our self-indulgence becomes sacred indulgence. Our selfishness becomes selflessness. But the, but the moment we place ourselves or some other thing other than Christ as the central substance of our soul, we will find ultimately a failed system and a failed attempt. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you have been trying by your own effort, your own merit, your own strength, to find this sense of curbing your self-indulgence and your selfishness and the destruction of your sin. And can I just tell you, stop. Jesus is the only thing. It is the gospel. It is the work of Christ on the cross and through his resurrection that offers us that the ability to change our orientation, the things we crave change. Um, in January, my wife and I, with a couple of our friends, did Whole30 I was so scared to do this. I don't know if you've ever read about this or heard about this, but it's essentially a 30-day cleanse. You can only eat whole foods and no sugars, fake sugars, no dairy, no beans or nuts or anything like that. And so it, you have to think about everything you're putting in your body. And at the end of 30 days, I'm thinking about self-indulgence. I'm like, I can't wait because I'm, I'm just going to go and I'm going to drink um, that, that coffee with sugar in it. I'm going to have this breakfast burrito. And the end of the 30 days came and what I realized is my cravings had changed. I didn't actually want the things that my body used to crave because I had been giving my body substance. And I think that that's the invitation that Christ gives us. Feast on Him. And the other things that we think we want will begin to start fading, fading away doesn't mean that there won't still be temptation and desire, but what it means is we will feed our souls what it truly longs for. Thirdly and lastly, when Christ is our substance, it solidifies our belonging. One of my favorite verses personally as I read this is in verse 20 says, If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Which is implying you belong to Christ. Paul over a dozen times uses this phrase, in Christ, with Christ, in Christ, throughout Colossians. He's trying to get them to understand, you don't belong to the world. You don't belong to the systems of the world. You belong to Him. In 1 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9, 19 through 20 says this, 
Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You are not your own. You were bought with a price that your worth is wrapped up with who you belong to now. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, you don't have to belong to the systems of the world, the shadows of the world. And again, it, those shadows sometimes are good things, like, like the law, it points towards Christ, like, like beauty, like art, like creation. Those things can point to Christ, but never mistake the creation for the Creator. And I think of this last verse in verse 20 for me, it just reminds you, you don't belong to the world. You belong to someone else. You belong to Jesus. And maybe that's, as you're watching this video, that's the message the Holy Spirit wants to just burn in your heart today. You belong to Jesus. Last story, my, my son Augustine um, loves to build things. And recently our neighbor gave us a large box that he was gonna recycle. And he's like, does your son want it? And I said, absolutely. And so we took this box, we cut out a hole and he got to crawl inside it and he immediately dubbed it his secret empire. I have no idea where he got this phrase, but Augustine had a secret empire in his room and it was his cardboard box and he drew on it and put pillows in it. It was so fun. Well, that secret empire box uh, ended up getting left outside and rained on and we had to get rid of it. And my son was so grieved. He's like, where's my secret empire? I'm like, sorry, it's, we got to get rid of it. But it's so fascinating that this, this cardboard box wasn't treated like all the other cardboard in our house that gets recycled. That cardboard box had a place of honor because of who it belonged to. And I think as long as we think we belong to the world, we will be treated with this certain value system that the world offers. But the same way that that cardboard that seemingly just something to toss out was so special to my son, how much more so do us when we realize we belong to Christ, we get to just sit and rest in that beauty of belonging because we are, our worth is known, our worth is solidified because we have been bought with a price. And the same way that my son would dwell within that little secret empire in his room, the message of Colossians is Christ dwells within you. And my prayer today is that you just rest, not in the shadow of things around you, but in the substance of Christ. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done and who you are. And we rest in you, Jesus. We rest in your finished work. Lord, we pray that we would not rely on shadows and assume them to be the substance. And Lord, I pray you'd also help use the shadows of the, of the Old Testament and the law or the other things in our lives just to, to point to you, God, the substance of our life. Lord, thank you so much that you change us and you fulfill us and that we belong to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I would love to invite you. We're going to have a song of worship right now. But um, afterwards, stick around because I would like for us to um, take communion together. And we're going to look back at the Jewish uh, feast of Passover and how that shadow pointed towards the substance of Christ. And so after this worship time and responding to Holy Spirit, um, stick around so that we can take communion together. And oh, and how he loves us. 
So we just spent some time talking about how these um, old Jewish holidays, traditions um, are, are shadows. And that doesn't necessarily mean a negative thing. It just means that you have to know its purpose and it points towards Christ. And so I thought it would be important today on Communion Sunday, we do this the first Sunday of each month, to think about how this shadow, if you will, was pointing towards Christ. So let's talk about the first Passover And this is a meal that's still celebrated. It's often called the Seder meal um, by the Jewish community. And this is the same meal that Jesus would have celebrated. And so I would encourage you, uh, maybe pause the video, grab some grape juice or wine, some bread. And um, I want to just point out just a couple things about the cup and the bread that I think are incredibly fascinating of how they pointed towards Christ. Uh, in In the Seder meal, in the Passover meal, there is four cups. Uh, The first cup was the cup of sanctification. This came right after the the getting the leaven out of the house. You'd find all the bread of leaven in it and you'd throw it away. And it's this idea of getting the sin out of your life. Uh, The second cup is um, known as the cup of judgment. 
And this was uh, brought together, this cup of judgment, speaking of how God rids the world of evil. And the next part of that, they would take bread, the matzo bread, and they would break it. And so it's interesting that at the cross was a moment of God's judgment being fulfilled in the breaking of Jesus. The third cup is known as the cup of redemption. And this is the actual cup that during the Jewish Passover, Jesus took at this point in the meal and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood of a new covenant. And so as we take the cup today, we're, we get to sit on this third cup of redemption. This is what Jesus came to bring. And the fourth cup is the cup of praise. There's one other element of the bread that I find incredibly fascinating. And there is this part where you take the unleavened bread, the matzah that's been broken, and you go and hide it. And so the, the kind of part of the Jewish Passover uh, meal and celebration is the kids go and find, I mean, just think about this, broken, broken bread that was without leaven, without sin, wrapped up, tucked away. And after the cup of redemption, they would go and find this wrapped broken bread, bring it together. And as it came out of the bread, they would have this cup of celebration. All that to say, communion is, is not just a Christian tradition. It has its roots deep within uh, the Mosaic law. And when we can understand the beauty of that, it just enriches that. So my encouragement to you, whether you're by yourself, whether you're with roommates, your family or friends, uh, take the cup of redemption that Jesus has offered through his body. Take that bread, break it. Remember the brokenness of Jesus that offers us wholeness. And before you end this time, would you remember that that fourth cup that's coming is celebration and that we live in a way that worships the Lord. Love you guys. Have an amazing week. Grace and peace to you.